Greetings, I am Tantus Naravan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome to Friday. It's time to talk about Pathfinder. So, today we're going to start talking about the classes. Now, the classes have a lot of details about them, and I wanted to go over a lot about them, so I'm going to split this into three parts. There are 11 classes in the core book. There are more in other books. I will talk about the rest of them other videos, because right now we're only going over stuff from the core handbook. That's what we're only going over. That's all we're talking about. We're going to add in the rest later. So, what four are we talking about today? The Barbarian, the Bard, the Cleric, and the Druid. We'll go alphabetical. So, let's start talking about them. Let's start with Barbarian. Barbarians are savage warriors which channel their rage into combat to make them go stronger and tougher so they can charge into battle, wielding their weapons. Without, like, caring what kind of hits they take, they're willing to absorb it just to defeat the enemy. Barbarians, they have to be chaotic. I will go over alignment in more detail. Alignment is something I haven't talked about a lot. There are nine alignments. They're based on the accesses of good versus evil and lawful, those that obey the rules versus chaotic, those that disregard the rules completely. In between them are all neutrals. So that's why there's nine. Sort of the corners are to the alignments, and in between there's neutrals, with the center neutral on both. So you have to be one of the chaotics. That's the only ruling for barbarian. So you get a d12 as your hit dice. Meaning at first level, you automatically get 12 hit points, plus your constitution as a bonus, of course, and every level, level after that, you will roll a d12 to see how many hit points you get. Now, I haven't mentioned this, but GMs can have special rules about gaining hit points. My favorite one is rather than roll when you gain a level, take half plus one. Meaning for the d12, I would get seven. Half of it is six plus one, seven. D10 would be 6, D8 would be 5, D6 would be 4. This is the system I like. But anyway, so D12, they get 4 plus their intelligence modifier skills. I'm not going to go over their list of skills, not for any of these classes. I just want to let you know how many they have. They have a full base attack bonus, meaning they get plus 1 every level. They have good fortitude. Now they're proficient with all simple and martial weapons and light and medium armor. I'll explain what these mean a little more with their classifications of type of weapons and armor that you can look at certain lists and it tells you this is light armor, or this is medium armor, this is a simple weapon, this is a martial weapon. That's what it says. These are the basic proficiencies you get. Now they also are proficient with shields. Anything they can use a shield, you could have a sword and a shield if you wanted to. Now they move a little faster. That's one of the bonus abilities they get some faster movement. It's only plus 10, but it's a good bonus. And the big ability they get is Rage. As, an, as for free on your turn, meaning it doesn't take you any sort of action to do, you can enter into a Rage. When you're a Rage, you get plus 4 bonus to your Strength and your Constitution, and the associating modifiers to all your stats that come in with that bonus. You also get a plus two bonus to any will saving throws, but you get a minus two penalty to AC, to your armor class, because you're reckless. So your muscles grow bigger, you get tougher and some more hit points, you're resisting things might try to affect your mind, but you're like reckless. Now, once you're in that rage, you can maintain it for four rounds, plus your constitution modifier, every day. And that's your unmodified. We're not adding in the bonus you get from raging. That doesn't apply here. This is your unmodified constitution modifier. So that's a big note. You don't add in the bonus you get from raging to the number of rounds you can rage. Now as you level, as you get stronger, more rounds are added on. But that's the basic. Now you can end your rage for free at any time, but for every round you were raging, you're then going to be fatigued. When you're fatigued, it's hard to run around, 
you get penalties to both your strength and your dexterity, and you're just sort of like tired out. You're not allowed to rage again when you're fatigued. So it's sort of like when I'm dropping out of my rage, I got a number of turns, I've got to wait before I can do it again. And if you're fatigued from something else, because you can get fatigued from something else, you can't rage then either. So, that's what you start with as a barbarian. As you level, you get more ra rounds of raging, your rage gets more powerful, there's also rage powers you can choose from. There's a whole list of special abilities that you can take that as you level up, you unlock them and you start like getting abilities like you can smash things better, maybe you're good at taking out people's weapons, maybe you're good at avoiding the effects of spells, all these things that take effect along with your rage. Barbarians also get the ability to absorb an amount of damage from physical attacks that things like swords and arrows deal them slightly less damage. They also get sort of sixth senses about danger so that they can avoid certain types of danger like surprise attacks or getting attacked from behind. So that's the barbarian. Next up we're going to talk about the bard. The bard is a traveling performer, musician, singer, who has sort of a little jack of all trades with skills and also brings magic in their song. So they have magic, they have special performances, they are often very sort of chaotic in nature because they're wandering, but they don't need to be. You could be any alignment for a bard. Now a bard gets a d8 hit dice, meaning we're using the eight-sided die. They get six plus your intelligence modifier skills from a pretty decent list. They have their own special selection of weapons to choose from. And they are proficient in light armor. Now the thing about bards and light armor, which I have to note, is they ignore spell failure. Now if you're looking at armor statistics, each armor has a little percentile, which it says is called arcane spell failure. What that means, talking about the rules, is if I'm wearing that type of armor, and I tra try to cast an arcane spell, I'll give the difference in a minute. I'll tell you the difference in the classes, if it's arcane or divine, and explain the difference. But if they're casting an arcane spell, they have that chance of failing it. It's a percentage chance, which means you roll the, doubles, the double number d10 and the normal d10, you roll them together, and if you get above that percentage, you're fine. Below it, the spell fails. So, they ignore that for light armor. That's an advantage of a bard. Now, they have three fourths base attack bonus, which means for every four levels, they gain three base attack, meaning at first level, zero. They have good reflex and will saves. So, they have two good saves. All right? They get spells. They will get up to six level spells. They have zero level spells. They cast arcane spells. Arcane spells are based on the magic inlaid in the universe sort of thing. It's, you're using, the difference between that and divine is divine, you're getting it from another source, not just the universe itself. Well, it, divine itself might be like a worship of nature or a worship of a deity, but that's sort of the difference between arcane and divine. Bards are arcane spellcasters. Going back to Barbarian, something I forgot to mention, the ability scores, which are good for them, Strength and Con, to match with their abilities. Getting to Bard here, their ability scores are Charisma. So they're good, and they need the Charisma. Everything else, as you need it. Intelligence might be good, dexterity might be good, strength might be good, depending on how you want to build it, but you need a great charisma to be a bard. Bards are no knowledge-based casters. What that means is, I know a certain number of spells, which I've learned, I know them, period. And then I have a number of slots I can fill. So if I know three first-level spells, and during the day, I have two first level spell slots, I can cast any combination of my three known spells in there. I could repeat the first one twice, 
I could do the first and third. I could do the third one twice. I could do two and three. Whatever it is, that's how a knowledge-based caster breaks down. I've sort of talked about this before, but that's what a bard is. Now they also get bardic knowledge. Bardic knowledge means if I'm not trained specifically at some kind of knowledge, I've picked up enough information that I can sort of roll on it and see. And I get a bonus based on my intelligence and my level at being a bard. So sort of like I have a smattering of extra knowledges that I've learned along the way that I'm like, hey, I knew about that. I heard about that. I didn't need to be trained in it to know about that. They also get bardic performances, which are special performances they can start to do to give a bonus. Uh, it starts off, you have to use a standard action to use it. I'll explain the actions later, but you begin to make it quicker and quicker. You get six plus charisma modifier, rounds per day you can perform. As you level, you get more, but that's sort of the basic number of rounds you can perform. What performances can I do? There's a performance for trying to counter someone using magic. There's one where you can distract someone with it. There's one where you can fascinate someone, where you can be like doing a little performance and they're just enthralled by you. And the best one, hmm, I can't say the best one, but the one you most likely will use the best is Inspire Courage, which gives a combat bonus to attack and damage to you and your teammates who can either hear or see you. When you perform, you choose whether you're doing it that they would have to see you or hear you. That's the choice you make when you start the performance. And as you level, again, you gain more bardic performances. You gain more rounds in it. There's all these other performances you can do. Your performances you started with get more potent. Uh, you also gain extra abilities, the, making you more jack-of-all-trades. You know, One of the abilities is actually called jack of all trades. You get better at sort of like a smattering of skills. So after bard, cleric. So clerics. <clears throat> they are divine spellcasters who either believe in a deity or a sort of ideal that they're trying to live up to. Now in Pathfinder and a lot of the sort of D&D based systems they look back to like the ancient civilizations, like the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, who had this pantheon of deities rather than just one, which a lot of the religions today have. D&D &D does a pantheon of religions, or I'm sorry, Pathfinder does. Each of these systems has their own pantheons. Pathfinder has their own pantheon. But, so you could serve one of those deities, or you could serve some kind of ideal if you wanted. That's what a cleric is. They're, they're divine warriors of that. So they get a d8 hit points. They only have two plus intelligence modifier skills. They are a three-fourths base attack. They get good fortitude and will for saves. Now, again, something I forgot to mention back about Bard. I've been pretty bad about it this time. Their spells are based on their charisma. When I said they needed charisma, it's also because their spells are based on it. Their spells potency, sometimes they get bonus ones for very high charisma. A cleric spells are based on their wisdom. If you have high, you have a better chance of them failing to avoid the effects of it, or it has, you might get bonus ones. They get up to ninth level spells from zero to nine. Clerics are memorization casters, they can actually choose from the entire list of cleric spells every day and choose a number of spells that they've memorized and then cast them. So they can't really switch out on the fly, but they can. They can do a little switching on the fly. A cleric who's based around healing can convert spells to healing spells. A cleric that's based around harming can convert spells to harming spells. They're called cure spells and inflict spells. They're a series of spells that have those words in the name. Cure spells heal hit points, inflict spells deal damage. This is based around your channel. Clerics level up this ability to channel, which means in a 30 foot radius, they heal everything. They can also use the channeling to harm undead if they're doing channel positive, which will heal. If they channel negative, 
it harms living creatures, heals undead creatures. Undead creatures are zombies, skeletons, vampires, that sort of thing. Your channeling gets more powerful as you level. It does more dice of either healing or harming. You get more of it based on your charisma modifier, so charisma is important, and how potent it is is also based on your charisma modifier. Things can resist if you're trying to hurt them with it. So if you channel positive, you cure spells when you're spontaneous. If you channel negative, you inflict spells when you go spontaneous. So I've talked about channeling, the spontaneous casting, and the spells of the cleric. Clerics need wisdom and charisma. A good wisdom, a good charisma are important. The other stats, up to you. What's next about clerics? Domains. Domains are something that clerics get. You get two of them. There's an entire list of domains. What domains can I choose from? It depends on what you chose as your divine source. If you chose a deity, a specific one, that deity tells you what domains you can choose from. It'll list like four or five domains which you can choose from. Two of them which are your purview. If you're a source of information, like I believe as my divine source in justice. You have justice as this ideal you sort of worship. Then you'd have to take domains that are based around justice. That would be your DM's approval if those domains fit into your purview of justice. Now what do domains give you? Domains give you two things. They first give you a number of abilities that you gain a first one at first level and another one at higher levels. These domains give you little powers that you can use associated with those two domains. Then domains also give you domain spells. What are domain spells? Now, every spell level you have, one to nine, you can choose a domain spell from either of the two domain lists and memorize it every day. So each domain has a list of spells from one to nine. So there's nine spells on that list, leveled one to nine, that at first level, when I have first at first level, when I only have first level spells, I can choose my domain spell from this list or this list. As soon as I get second level spells, I can choose my first level domain spell from let's say this list and my second level from this list and I go back and forth as much as I want. I could have only one ever spell I memorize from this list. And I could be like, I like eight spells from this list. When I get to ninth level spells, you could do that. Or you could zigzag back and forth. Or you could only take the spells from one domain. Maybe I only like the domain abilities of this one. I only like the spells over here. Could be either. But that's what you get for domains. Now there is something I forgot to mention for clerics. Their proficiencies, I didn't say it earlier. They are proficient with all simple weapons, and then light, medium armor, and shields. That's what they're proficient with equipment-wise. So let's move on to druids. Druids are another divine spellcaster like clerics, but they believe in nature. They are warriors of nature, or, or scions of nature. They are representatives of them. They call upon nature itself for their divine magic. So they get a d8 hit points, they have 3 fourths base attack bonus, they have good fortitude and willpower, they have 4 plus intelligence modifier skills. Now they use spells just like clerics. They have a list, they memorize it from every day, they even use wisdom as their ability modifier like a cleric. So wisdom is very important for a druid. But druids, wisdom is the only one important for. I will say that. The other ability scores, debatable. So, unlike a cleric, they don't generally have domains, and they spontaneous they spontaneous cast differently. While a cleric, I mentioned, spontaneously casts either heal or harm, a druid spontaneously casts to cast a spell called Summon Nature's Ally. What is that? Summon Nature's Ally, there is a version of it for every level of spell, from 1 to 9. So if I convert a first level spell to it, I'm casting Summon Nature's Ally 1, and so forth down the list. For each of those spells, there's a list of animals or other nature-based creatures 
you can summon to your aid temporarily to help you fight. So I can choose to get rid of whatever my first level spell I memorized is to summon a creature to my aid. Come forth and help me. Or you could Pokemon it. Be like, I choose you, a bison. Come to my aid, bison. Be like that. That's the spontaneous casting of a druid. Now, what else does a druid get? Druids have the ability to diplomatize with animals. The skill diplomacy means I can change the attitude of enemies or other people to make them friendlier to me. They can do that with animals. They can make animals friendly, more friendly with them. They also get a choice of a bond in nature. They either get the one domain from a smaller list than clerics get that they get the abilities from, get domain spells the same way, or they get to bond with an animal, meaning they have an animal companion. Animal companions are like mini characters. They have their own ability scores, skills, feats, all the things that a normal character would have, except it's dependent on the rules of animal companion. It will tell you where its ability scores start with, what it gets, to a degree. It will tell you, you can choose from these skills, you can choose from these feats. You know, it gives you a list. And as you get stronger, it gets stronger. It's not going to be like, you want to open a monster manual, which are the books that tell you all the monsters, or a bestiary, as it's called in Pathfinder and find a wolf and that would be what you have. Your wolf would be different, it's traditionally stronger. But you could have other animals too. You could have a lion, a tiger, whatever. So as druids get stronger, they become more in tune with nature, they can pass through woods without disturbing leaves and making tracks, they get immunities to poison, they get the ability to wild shape, which means they can temporarily transform themselves into an animal, so they're an animal too. Uh, they eventually get abilities to change into elementals, which are these powerful creatures made out of the natural elements. They're made of fire, air, water, or rock, slash earth, that these creatures of these elements, they can trans the druid can transform into them and become pretty powerful. So anyway, that's it for today. So please, like if you, leave a like if you enjoyed this video, subscribe, we're always looking for more citizens, leave a comment too. And until next time, I bid you farewell.